This program provides a biblical perspective on news, including insightful interviews with elected leaders, newsmakers, and cultural experts. I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a great program coming up, but first, here are some headlines from our friends with FISM News. For FISM News, I'm Samuel Case with your Washington Watch News update for Tuesday, April 9th. Well, we'll begin with this. Some pro-life Republicans are not too happy with Donald Trump's abortion policy. The former president released a statement yesterday saying he plans to leave the issue up to the individual states should he be reelected, rejecting calls for a 15-week federal ban. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham was one of the first Republicans to recommend a 15-week ban. He released a statement saying he respectfully disagrees with Trump's view that abortion should be completely left up to the states, saying, quote, the pro-life movement has always been about the well-being of the unborn child, not geography. Trump fired back, saying a federal ban would cause Republicans to lose the election. Meanwhile, former Vice President Mike Pence, he also released a statement calling Trump's policy a slap in the face to pro-life voters. But despite the negative reaction from other Republicans, it looks like Trump isn't backing down. FISM's Ian Patrick has more. Trump is running with the assumption that his role in ending Roe v. Wade will actually help carry him over the line. As he reaffirmed in his video and many times before then, Trump said he was proudly responsible for the defeat of Roe v. Wade. He then told Americans to follow their heart on the issue individually, and he tried to let Americans also know that winning elections can spark more positive change. This 50-year battle over Roe v. Wade took it out of the federal hands and brought it into the hearts, minds, and vote of the people in each state it was really something. Now it's up to the states to do the right thing. You must follow your heart of this issue, but remember, you must also win elections to restore our culture and, in fact, to save our country, which is currently and very sadly a nation in decline. Always go by your heart, but we must win. We have to win. And overseas, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says a date has finally been set for Israel's invasion of Rafah in southern Gaza. He did not give further details, but he did say the operation is critical to Israel's victory against Hamas. Israel says four Hamas battalions remain in Rafah, as well as an unknown number of senior commanders as well. Here's Netanyahu. Today I received a detailed report on the talks in Cairo. We are constantly working to achieve our goals. First and foremost, the release of all our hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas. The victory requires entry into Rafah and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there. It will happen. There is a date. Now, Biden has threatened to pull support from Israel if it doesn't take more steps to protect civilians. Israel is currently preparing to evacuate civilians from Rafah and has reportedly purchased 40,000 tents ahead of that evacuation. Netanyahu says Israel will enter Rafah with or without America's support. Now, this all comes as the CIA is now proposing a new hostage deal specifically for Israel. CIA Director Bill Burns presented a new proposal on Sunday in Cairo. You heard Netanyahu mention that. Uh, if accepted, it could lead to the release of 40 Israeli hostages and also a six-week ceasefire in Gaza, but it would also mean the release of 700 Palestinian prisoners. 100 of those are currently serving life sentences for killing Israelis. And with that, those are today's headlines from FISM News. Once again, I'm your host, Samuel Case. And as always, don't forget you can catch our full show tonight. As always, that'll be 5 p.m. Eastern time on our website. It's FISMnews.tv. That's FISMnews.tv. We'll be covering these stories and so much more. By the way, you can also find us on social media and also by downloading the FISM app right to your smartphone so you can take our news wherever you go. Now stay tuned for Washington Watch with Tony Perkins, and I'll see you tomorrow with more news coverage.
From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Welcome to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us. There is a lot to cover today, so let's get right to it. First up, question is, is President Biden buying votes with your tax dollars? Today, I'm proud to announce five major actions to continue to relieve student debt for more than 30 million Americans since this, I started my administration. Folks, I will never stop to deliver student debt relief on hardworking Americans, and it's only in the interest of America that we do it. And again, it's for the good of our economy. Wow. Uh, it'd be great to see him eradicate $34 trillion in debt, that a lar large part of that that he's amassed as president. Uh, also, I, I don't know if, if uh, probably it's a small thing to this administration, but the Supreme Court said the White House didn't have the authority to erase student loan debt. We're going to talk about that on this edition of Washington Watch. Also, the House is back in D.C. today, and several issues are front and center. Funding for Ukraine and Israel, reauthorization of FISA, and it's not without drama. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who filed a motion to vacate the chair prior to the Easter break, circulated a letter today uh, to Republicans laying out her case against Speaker Johnson. We're going to talk with Florida Congressman Mike Waltz in just a moment. And as we discussed yesterday. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others. And that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. Well, uh, that was President Trump announcing his post row abortion policy, which is not being welcomed with open arms. We're going to talk with South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham a little bit later here on Washington Watch. And this still has people scratching their heads asking, how could this happen? This is why Imam Khomeini, who declared the International Day of Quds, this is why he would say to pour all of your all of your chants and all of your shouts upon the head of America. Death to America. Now that was a pro-Hamas rally. Not in Gaza, but in Dearborn, Michigan, on the final day of Ramadan. We're going to explore what this means for the future of America with Kamal Salim, president of Qum Ministries. And finally. I do think that we, we are culturally a Christian country. I'm, I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm, I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. That was new atheist Richard Dawkins on Easter Sunday in the U.K., now, what's interesting about that statement is Dawkins has spent most of his life basically trying to push Christianity out of the public square. We'll explore this recognition that all of society actually benefits from Christianity. But this fact only appears to be recognized after Christianity has been successfully repressed or in some cases replaced. Dr. Albert Moeller joins me for that conversation. So don't go anywhere as we have a packed program full of insightful discussions and analysis. And uh, remember, our guiding principles at Washington Watch, faith, family, and freedom. These are not just words. They are the values that form the very foundation of our nation. Washington Watch starts now. House Republicans have refused to move because an increasingly vocal pro-Russian, pro-Putin minority seems to be running the show within their ranks a contingent that takes its marching orders directly from Donald Trump. That, of course, was Senate scare leader Chuck Schumer earlier today uh, denouncing the House for not advancing the supplemental bill passed by the Senate, which includes uh, funding for both Ukraine, Israel and for Taiwan. Now, what Senator Schumer does not say is that uh, he's been sitting on a measure for about three months that would provide essential funding to Israel. Of course, the Increasingly, we're finding in the Senate that the support for Israel is diminishing among Democrats. We're going to talk about that today as well. Uh, before we go to our first guest, I, I want to, uh, to go to Ben Johnson, uh, Washington Stand reporter, on a, a new report uh, showing that a new study, actually, that shows that transgender teens actually grow out of the, their uh, uh, dysphoria, sexual, their gender dysphoria, 
if they're simply given space. Uh, ben, welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to be with you as always, Tony. So this is something that's been talked about for some time, but this new report uh, verifies and validates what many have said that they're rushing children into these gender treatment programs, trying to lock them into a period of time in which they're confused about their gender. Yes, this is a wide-ranging study, and it's incredibly important because it follows the same people for 15 years of their life, from age 11 to age 26. Uh, more than 2,700 young people in uh, the Netherlands and 2,700 uh, young people is a lot in the Netherlands because of the small population that they have. But they ask them at every three-year interval uh, their identity with their, an opposite gender. They find at age 11, it's fairly common about one in 10 uh, children say that they wish to identify with the opposite gender. So uh, by the time they are age 26, 15 years later, that's fallen to one in 25. Uh, that is to say, two out of three immediately will cease to have any feelings of trans transgender ideology, uh, gender dysphoria. That will simply go away if they are left untreated. Uh, however, we do know from studies when someone starts on the path, on that trail to uh, gender transition, almost 100% of people who are put on puberty blockers then go on to cross-sex hormones, and many of those ultimately go on to surgery. So the, uh, the theory is that there's something about that process that locks people into right. a transgender ideology they wouldn't otherwise have. Something more at work here than just the well-being of the children, obviously. Uh, ben Johnson, thanks so much. Uh, insightful study. We're going to unpack that more. I know there's some articles at the Washington Stand that you've written that uh, provide more insight. Uh, as always, appreciate you uh, being here today. Thank you, Tony. Well, joining me now from the House to discuss uh, more on what is happening on Capitol Hill this week, Congressman Mike Waltz. He serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He represents the 6th Congressional District of Florida. Congressman Waltz, welcome back to Washington Watch. As always, great to see you. Yeah, thanks. Good to be with you, Tony. So let's talk. I, I played a clip just a moment ago of Senator Schumer over there basically bashing the House for not moving the Senate supplemental bill, uh, essentially accusing conservative uh, Republicans in the House of being pro-Putin, pro-Russia. Um, of course, he didn't mention that he's been sitting on a bill funding Israel for about three months. So I guess he's pro-Hamas then. Yeah. Well, not just one bill, Tony, two bills. Uh, one who had a pay for uh, by uh, reducing some IRS agents, some of the, you know, 87,000 that were included in a couple of other bills. Uh, but then even one without a pay for that just adds to our debt but helps Israel. He's been sitting on both now for months and months. So you're right, I guess that makes him pro Hamas. Look, we've asked for a couple of things, Tony, and they are common sense questions. What's the strategy? What's the end state? What are we trying to achieve? We have stopped Putin uh, in Ukraine, but how does this come to an end? What's in line with our interests? Are the Europeans paying their fair share? By the way, I don't believe that they are. And when it comes to this package, you know, should uh, American teachers, first responders, and others who often aren't paid enough be subsidizing the paychecks of Ukrainian teachers and first responders? Can the Europeans do that humanitarian aid? And when it comes to just the military portions, um, we need to differentiate those that are replenishing our stocks versus those who are coming uh, to Ukraine. And finally, Tony, this is the part that upsets me the most. Biden's bad energy policy and the progressive climate agenda that's going after American oil and gas that should be flooding the world market with cleaner American gas, driving down the price of oil, drying up Putin's war machine coffers and Iran's for that matter. Uh, why don't we go after the source of the problem, but instead Putin's selling just as much oil and gas as he ever was. He's just doing it through China and India. He's flush with cash. He's funding his war machine. Biden has an LNG ban. Uh, in place here. And uh, oh, by the way, we're now spending against ourselves through Ukraine and by allowing uh, uh, Russian oil and gas to head out into the world market. How about you enforce the sanctions in the first place, Schumer? 
Of course, this is not the only place where we have a uh, almost a uh, schizophrenic policy when it comes to our, our foreign policy. All very valid points and questions that you bring up. This is intertwined this week with a motion that was uh, filed to vacate the chair prior to the Easter break. A letter was circulated to the Republicans uh, today by Marjorie Taylor Greene making her case. And of course, the supplemental funding tied into that. Where do we stand on this motion to vacate? I mean, after all of the chaos and confusion the last one created, uh, which you were opposed to, I was opposed to, are we going to see that again in the House? Well, look, you have to ask Representative Green. She certainly hasn't talked to me about it. Now, what I want to stay focused on is stopping Biden's uh, progressive left wing agenda, oversight, things that we answers that we still have to get to the bottom of, like accountability for Afghanistan, those 13 gold star families, Hunter Biden and his corruption and how he's influenced his father with commingled accounts and paying uh, his bills. We are already working on the next budget that will be due uh, in September. We have to cut out of control spending there. So look, you can kick over the table. Uh, I'm upset about a lot of things that have been in these bills. I voted against several of them. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, by the time you stop everything, go back into a speaker's race, and gee, at the end of the day, we need to win in November the best way to fix these problems is to expand our majority uh, to get President Trump into the White House uh, and to flip the Senate. And I just don't think that firing the speaker right now is the best way to achieve that. Well, there's also a risk associated with that. You mentioned uh, oversight. You want to get back to these oversight hearings. With, with, with a one or two seat margin, there's the real possibility that you could lose the speakership and the first time in history it could slip into Democratic hands. Then there's no backstop to this administration and what they're trying to do. For instance, as the president has announced, more erasure of student loan debt. I mean, even after the Supreme Court slapped him down, he's doing it again. W what's going to be the outcome of that? Well, I mean, case in point, everybody remembers uh, what I think was a hugely consequential hearing uh, with the presidents of Harvard, MIT, and uh, UPenn and our education committee uh, and the anti-Semitism that's going on, the pro-Hamas protests that they're allowing. If we didn't have the majority, that hearing would have never happened. It would have never seen the light of day or any of the other Afghanistan, COVID or otherwise. Uh, and that's what's at stake. On the student loan, look, it's unconstitutional. They're doing it on the backs of a veterans bill after 9-11, number one. Number two, it's immoral. It's unfair uh, to those truck drivers, first responders, blue collar workers, uh, to my family who worked hard to pay off their debt. Uh, service members who serve their country in exchange for it. Uh, and I just think it teaches young people all the wrong lessons. And we're going to fight it every tooth and nail. But to your point, we got to have the majority to do yeah. that. We got to yeah. have the gavel. We got to be in power. I mean, so succinctly put, it is wrong on so many fronts. And it is an affront to so many Americans. Uh, Congressman Mike Waltz, always great to see you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Tony. God bless. Uh, be praying because there is this effort afoot, and I think it would be foolishness. I said it before when we had uh, Kevin McCarthy there, but this time even worse. All right, Senator Lindsey Graham joins us after the break. Don't go away. America was a bright light until the culture gave into darkness. But we won't. We are in a battle for the soul of our nation, between right and wrong, between truth and lies. At a time when the mainstream media is blocking Americans from truth, millions are searching for a source of trustworthy news that shines a light in the darkness. At this time of great need, FRC is lighting the way forward. For 40 years, Family Research Council and its partners have stood together to advance and defend biblical truth in government and culture. Between our flagship broadcast program, Washington Watch, with Tony Perkins, to our news outlet, The Washington Stand, FRC is providing believers across the country with news they can trust from a biblical worldview. When you stand with FRC, you help light the way forward for America and the next generation. Go to frc.org slash give.
The most underscored scripture in the Bible is this scripture. John 15 and 5, Jesus speaking, for without me, you can do nothing. This is not about sucking it up. It's not about pulling up your bootstrap. It's about turning from this to something, someone, and his name is Jesus, who enables us and empowers us to be the men of God that he's called us to be. Brothers, listen to me. You have been endowed with authority from heaven to put your hand up against all of the forces of darkness that is coming against you and against your household. And if you will use that rightful authority, God himself will stand in back of it. God has given you, as the parent, as the father of your children, the responsibility and the authority to teach your children. You are not to outsource that to your wife or to your pastor. You are the spiritual leader of your home. You will never be faithful in serving your calling if you're not faithful in your family relationships. It just won't happen. I don't need entertainment. I don't need opinions. I don't need a soft message. I need the Bible. I came to hear the Word of God today. That's what we need today, the Word of God. Welcome back to Washington Watch, the website, TonyPerkins.com. Be sure and visit TonyPerkins.com because we've got resources there for you. All right, as I was uh, rushing into the break, I was making a comment to uh, Congressman Waltz about if the uh, motion to vacate the chair, meaning to basically boot the House Speaker, were to go through, given the fact that there's such a narrow margin that it could result in the Democrats gaining control of the House for the first time in the middle of a session. It's never happened before where the Congress has switched hands in terms of the majority during the midst of a session of Congress. That could happen. Very real possibility. Don't have time to unpack that, but I'll get to that maybe uh, maybe tomorrow. But be praying. It, it, it would not be a good thing uh, either way. All right. I discussed this yesterday on uh, Washington Watch. Uh, President, uh, former President Donald Trump released a video yesterday morning, a statement explaining his uh, position on abortion uh, post Roe. And um, we must protect the most innocent among us. And creating a culture of life requires work at every level of government. Now, the former president followed up his video with social media posts stating that Republicans are losing elections due to the life issue. But the extreme position of the Democrats is a losing issue. And Republicans must build consensus for creating a culture of life uh, that is embraced by all. And, and, and that's how we got here. That's how we came to this point after 50 years of seeing Roe overturned. We went from one consensus point to another. It took time, but we got there because we never abandoned this basic understanding that all life has value because it is created in the image of God. And there is a role, yes, at the states, and I'm excited about that as a former state legislator who passed a number of pro-life laws, but there's a role at the federal level. And joining me now to talk more about this, Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. He serves on four Senate committees, including the Senate Judiciary Committee, where he's a ranking member in the Senate Appropriations Committee, and he's the author of a number of pro-life pieces of legislation. Senator Graham, welcome back to Washington Watch. God bless you and your listeners. We need you now more than ever. Well, uh, let me ask you, were you surprised by the president's statement? Because I know uh, you've had many conversations because I've been in, involved yeah. in some of those with the president. Yeah, no, we met with him. Um, here's what I would say. I think, you, you know, it's a comma, not a period. <clears throat> you know, this is tough politics. I, I get that. I admire the president. He was a great pro-life president. But we got to sit down and think and pray about what comes next for the pro-life movement. You know, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, that was my bill. It took 10 years. Partial birth abortion took 15 years. I've been told that my uh, pain-capable limit on abortion at 15 weeks, we don't have the votes. I said, you're right, but you'll never have the votes unless you make an effort to get the votes. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to find consensus. Here's where consensus exists in America. Um, at 15 weeks, the child can suck his thumb, capable of feeling pain. About 70% of Americans would limit abortion at 15 weeks. I understand the state rights issue to a point, Tony, 
but I am not going to sit on the sidelines and watch California and New York and other states allow abortion on demand up to the moment of birth without trying to do something about let, it. Let me ask you a clarifying question there for just a moment, Senator. But your legislation that you propose at the 15 weeks allows states to go further, like Oklahoma, yes. Louisiana. They can continue 100%. to do what they're doing. It's a minimum standard. It's not a. It doesn't override state law. It puts a minimum. You can do what you want to at the state level up to a point. And I pick 15 weeks. Why not I pick 15 weeks? Because we know the pain, uh, the, the the baby can feel pain. Uh, you need Ben Carson on the show to explain what a child is like at 15 weeks. You know, the French limit abortion at 14 weeks. I mean, 12 to 15 weeks is sort of the normal standard for European nations. I'm trying to get America to focus on the child, not geography. Right. See, the pro-life movement to me is about the well-being of the child. You find consensus where you can. This idea that it's a states' rights issue takes away from the fact that it's about the child all the time, every time. So geography is not the point of the pro-life movement. The point of the pro-life movement is protect unborn children to the best you can and find consensus. So, yes, states can be more restrictive, but at 15 weeks, uh, my bill draws a line because the baby can feel pain. Right. And uh, we need to be against late-term abortions. Uh, and let me talk about that consensus for just a moment, Senator, because – Consensus is an educational process. You're bringing people mm -hmm. along. And so we're having these conversations. Doesn't mean we stop there. I mean, no, I certainly, God, no. I, I've, been, I've been very clear on this. I am for protecting life from the moment of conception on. But I understand that in, the, in this republic in which we live and how we operate, we've got to come to a consensus on certain points. So we work and we get to a point and then we work and we get to another point. That's how it works. Well, that's called, I mean, that's the way it works in your personal life. That's the way it works in, in, in your political life. Here's what I want the pro-life movement to be about, the child, okay? Right. I want it to be a, um, a joyful movement. I want it to be helping the mother make good decisions. I want it to be a loving and caring movement. I don't want to say that there's no room in Washington for the unborn. I don't want to say to our nation that the Capitol is closed when it comes to protecting the unborn. It is a state issue. I agree with that up to a point. Then it becomes a human rights issue. Right. You know, remember the Dred Scott decision? There was a time in our country where some states could own slaves if they wanted to, and other states didn't have to. You know what we said? Nobody should own a slave. Right. There'll come a day. When science and education by you, me, and others will convince the American people that late-term abortions are barbaric, and I am going to keep fighting this, advocating for this, because I do believe late-term abortions are barbaric. And, and we can disagree in this process and work together. Like Donald Trump, I, I, I am assuming that your golf games will continue. And you'll have conversations like with it. Listen, uh, President Trump was a great president on the life issue. He was a strong commander in chief. I enthusiastically support him, but I'm not building, you know, I'm in Congress and the Senate for a reason, and that's to advance the cause the best right. I can. I compromise with Democrats. I get conservatives mad because I'm trying to move the ball on immigration and other things. I try to be a practical guy, but well grounded. My goal as a member of the Senate is to continue to educate the American people about the unborn and try to find consensus and protect them where, where we yeah. can. The Unborn Victims of Violence Act was my bill. It was the Lacey Peterson case. Right. Me and Mar uh, Mike DeWine. It is now a federal crime Senator, to attack a pregnant woman. We're up, we're up against a break. I hate to cut you child. off. I hate to cut you off. We're up against a break. We've got to get okay. you back to talk Iran-Israel later. But for now, we got to go.
Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us on this uh, Tuesday. I tell you what, uh, it seems like the clock's running faster. It must be uh, since the, uh, the eclipse. Uh, the clock's running faster. I'm running out of time. All right, uh, this happened uh, last week, but it was uh, a Al Quds Day rally in Dearborn, Michigan. Right. Pro-Hamas activists in the crowd called for death to Israel, death to America. Now, this is not new. It's becoming a little more prominent since October the 7th. Uh, this has been the climate in Dearborn for years. Uh, I, I recall it's been quite a long time ago. I was up there um, speaking at an event nearby and uh, he heard the call to prayers going out over the city, the Muslim call to prayers. Um, the calls for violence have been ramping up following the October 7th terrorist attacks on Israel, which led to anti-Semitic rallies in the U.S. cities openly celebrating the violence of that day, calling for death to America. I mean, this is in America. Death to America. Now, what threat do these rallies and calls for jihad against Israel in the United States pose? Well, join me now to discuss this is um, we're going to go in just a moment. We're having a little technical difficulties here. Um, we're going to go to Kam uh, Kamal Salim. Uh, he is the president of Kum Ministries and the author of The Blood of the Lambs, a former terrorist memoirs of death and redemption uh, and Ishmael Redeemed, another book that he's written. Um, this is very dangerous. This is happening on our own soil. Uh, in fact, I want to play that clip for us uh, again that, that I played at the at, at, at the open of this rally in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, play clip eight, please. So when these fools ask us if Israel has the right to exist, the chant death to Israel has become the most logical chant shouted across the world today. El Monte Israel! El Monte Israel! And then, of course, it uh, morphs into a call for death to America, to the United States. Number one, I think this is a, um, a result of a tremendously failed immigration policy. You know, we, we have this idea they're just going to let everybody in. And, and sometimes I think it's intentional what we've been seeing at our southern border to let people in who want to do harm to this country. I think this is being done intentionally by those who, who want to see America taken down. And this, this should prompt uh, rethinking of our immigration policy, who we allow to come into this country, and what we allow to operate. I mean, yes, we have freedoms. We have First Amendment freedoms. But there are limits to what we should allow. All right, I think we have uh, Kamal. Uh, Kamal, welcome to Washington Watch. Great to see you, brother. It's good to be with you, brother Tony. So uh, I, I gave a little bit about your background uh, coming out of the, the terrorist world. What do you make of the calls for jihad and the open support for Hamas terrorists in Dearborn, Michigan? This is number one. It's we need to understand that we are dealing with intifada. Intifada is it's a process jihad. Jihad is the cornerstone of Islam, meaning everything in Islam is based on jihad. So if it's not in tune in jihad, then it has no purpose. Number two, we need to understand that this is a Muslim Brotherhood agenda uh, it, that is established in 19, uh, 1917 in the United States of America, the Holy Land Foundation trial. And now they are on, uh, on, on stage number six. Number six is the plan is to fulfill their plan in the United States of America, where to establish one Islamic hegemony, one Islamic world and support each other. And so therefore, if it's uh, Palestine that is being hit today, Therefore, they must stand for Palestine. And the only thing that's standing before them is the United States of America, who is the great Satan to the Muslim people and uh, in order to destroy Israel. So th they're literally using the freedoms that they have here in America to destroy our freedoms. 
Yes, because the Muslim could not assimilate to the culture. And so because if they assimilate, so they have to abide in our United States Constitution. But if they do not assimilate, then they can incorporate their Sharia into our system, which is they would like to rule by Sharia instead of uh, being, uh, being under our Constitution. Because if they are under the United States Constitution, what happened is they will not be rising up in intifada, which is rebelling against the United States of America. So right now they are part of the, uh, this jihadism and they are trying to rally Muslims and all other, uh, you know, effect like they use Malcolm X, they use other things, you know, to do, for the destruction of the United States of America, calling right now for Islamic establishment, which is rezoning the United States of America, which is, uh, you know, state within states. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're out of time, but this is something that requires uh, a much lengthier conversation. We're going to get you back, Kamal, to, to, to talk more about this. And how do we, how do we stop it? I mean, how do we protect America from this threat that is literally coming from within? Uh, Kamal, great to see you, brother. Thanks so much for taking time to join us. We're going to finish this conversation on another day. Thank you, brother Tony. All right, folks. Uh, wow. Time's going by fast today. We're going to come back on the other side of the break. Dr. Al Mohler joins me as there's a growing recognition of the understanding of the value of Christianity, even by those who don't like Christianity. Once it's gone, what do we need to do to make sure it doesn't go away? That's next. The Lord reigns. Let America rejoice. From coast to coast, let justice reign. Peace reign. Righteousness reign. Lord, let it reign. May the clouds of blessings gush and rain down upon us. Yet even in the clouds, we see the light of your face. Make your face shine on these states, we pray. We pray and then we work. We work in the strength you provide. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strengthen our hands to do all to God's glory. Whether we eat or drink or vote, everything is holy. So we vote to God's glory. We vote because we can. We vote because we love our nation. We vote because we love our people. The people rejoice when the righteous rule, but when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Adorn our land with oaks of righteousness. Place men, place women, place those in authority who know their place, who know that they are under authority. Men and women who will stand for the true, for the good, for a more beautiful America. But how can they stand if we don't stand? We must stand. Lift us up. Help us stand. Raise us to that summit, which is yourself. For those you raise to that summit, do not fall. You are able to keep us from falling. Until that day when we do fall, fall before your throne, where our king reigns now. Now, let us rejoice and pray, vote, stand. Amen. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more.
Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us today. The website, TonyPerkins.com. And let me remind you, coming up May the 19th, Pray For and Stand With Israel Sunday. And if you'd like to find out more how you can participate in that as Israel is looking to evangelical Bible-believing Christians in the United States to stand with them as their very existence is on the line Text the word Israel to 67742. That's Israel to 67742. Our word for today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 26. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments, and his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made in praise and name and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. Now, to the globalist, this is like fingernails on a chalkboard. Not all nations are the same, nor are all people. Yes, we are all created in the image of God and equal in our human agency to choose whether or not we will follow God and yield to him. But from that choice flows outcomes which can make people an exceptional people. To find out more about our journey through the Bible, go to frc.org slash Bible or text Bible to 67742. Well, as we were just discussing this rally in Dearborn, Michigan, where pro-Hamas Islamic leaders were chanting not only death to Israel, but death to America, Well, the United Kingdom is also finding that there is something that always fills the void. When you move Christianity out, you push it to the fringes of society, something is going to fill the void. Join me now to discuss this and more is Dr. Albert Moeller, president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's the author of many books, including Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, The Explosive Power of Jesus' Parables. Dr. Moeller, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to see you. Thank you, Tony. Always good to be with you. So I'm going to get your reaction uh, to the um, last day of Ramadan, the Al-Quds gathering in Dearborn, Michigan, chance to a chance from the crowd, death to Israel and death to America. Um, That's in the United States of America. Yeah, well, it's a wake-up call, isn't it? And, you know, it's it's frankly there such in a public way that it's impossible for the left to deny it. And so it does remind us that Western civilization, and even more pressingly, Israel, faces an existential threat. There are people that just want to see Israel wiped off the map. And quite honestly, some of the same enemies want to see the United States and all of Western civilization wiped off the map. So even as there are people who want to suggest that, that this is just the accusation coming from the right, there you have it from the lips of people who are supporting Hamas right here in the United States. And you know what? We need to take them at their word. Right. I mean, they're, they're, it's not like they're whispering it. They're shouting it from right. the streets with open defiance. But I, I share that because just recently in the United Kingdom, actually on um, Easter Sunday, uh, Richard Dawkins, who the new atheist who has uh, basically made a career out of trying to bash Christianity yeah. and push it out of the public square, it, it basically made an admission that, look, the UK has benefited because it has a Christian culture, and, and I'm a cultural Christian, not a believer, but a cultural Christian. You can't have the benefits of Christianity without Christianity, though, and they're finding that out. Something is filling the void, and in the UK, it is also Islam. You know, Tony, that's so right. And, you know, that's something that we can see in Britain uh, a little faster than maybe we can see it in the United States, because Britain has an aristocracy, and and Britain has, uh, you know, a, a monarchy and all the rest. And so there has been the argument from the cultural left in England for a long time, and, and, and frankly, from the kind of this, this entire atheist agnostic culture, that we can have the goods of Christianity without Christianity. And someone like Richard Dawkins, I wrote a book on him more than two decades ago. I mean, he's been at this a long time. You know, made his name in the a theological sense by becoming one of the new atheists and making this incredibly uh, arrogant argument against the existence of God. But you know what? 
Richard Dawkins thinks he can be without God, but he wants to have religion because he, he wants the religion that shaped Western civilization. He, he wants the aesthetics. You know, famously, he was caught in church on like a Christmas Eve service not too long ago. He likes the music. And, you know, uh, your point is exactly the right point, and that is there is no existing and surviving Christian culture without Christian truth. And, you know, we better be the way people understand that. And by the way, Britain and certainly the intellectual elites in the United States are proved positive of the impossibility of trying to hold on to the form and denying the substance. You know, uh, Dr. Mullen, when I, when I read his statement, it, it kind of reminded me back in high school when, you know, every time I get, of course, gasoline was a lot cheaper back then, but I was only able to put about a dollar in the tank at a time. And, and I ran out of gas yeah. a lot. And, and I can remember just kind of coasting into the filling station in order to get some gas. I kind of feel like, you know, that's where the culture is. It's simply coasting on the fumes of the past, of the presence of Christianity. And I think Dawkins is beginning to realize that. Yeah, you know, a famous uh, German jurist said years ago that uh, Western civilization had a Christian inheritance and it's just spending it down fast. Uh, and it, it spends it down slowly, by the way, and then fast. And, and, and that's the way it works. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. And, you know, Richard Dawkins to connect the two things we've been talking about here, Richard Dawkins is very concerned about Islam. He's very yeah. scared of Islam, and he wants some kind of Christian culture to counter Islam. But you know what? Islam comes to us with incontrovertible theological claims. It's absolute insanity to think that the West can answer theological Islam with cultural Christianity. That's just as stupid as it could be. Well, but that's what we've seen in our foreign policy for decades is that we have tried with this secular worldview to combat the, uh, that mindset coming out of Islam, and look what's happened. It's only spread. Yeah, and you know, it's really interesting. The intellectual elites, they just can't acknowledge that something's genuinely theological. And, and so, by the way, it's one of the reasons why you look at the talking head television shows on cable, you know, and especially you know, on the left, and what they will do is they'll bring in a Muslim specialist to talk about Islam, but it's always someone who's so liberal within Islam, they couldn't dare go to Saudi Arabia or you know, Dubai, much less Iran, they'd be arrested and worse. Uh, the, the reality is that Islam is a, it's making a very serious, straightforward theological claim. And uh, the only answer to that has to be equally theological, right. quite frankly. The, 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 I, I, it was a number of years ago. Uh, I, I mean, you may have actually been at that meeting as well. I, I don't recall. It was in New York. Uh, it was a, a group of about 100 people that came together, and it was, a, it was church leaders from uh, the U.K., from Africa and elsewhere. They're talking about the spread of Islam, and, and, and the one takeaway after this entire uh, day or day-and-a-half-long conference uh, was the only thing that can stop the spread of Islam is the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. You know, I remember that meeting, and I'll tell you, the shocking thing to me was the fact that you had so many American and, say, European church leaders who seemed to be confused about this. But I think you'll recall, the church leaders who were absolutely clear on this issue were the African bishops. Right, Because right. they knew exactly what we were dealing with. They, they, right. You know, I, I talked to one of the bishops. He'd just done the funeral for priests murdered by Islamic terrorists. Yep. They know exactly what they're up against. And, and that... Now, uh, that was probably 15 years ago. Um, that now yeah. is spreading in the United States. When you see this in Dearborn, Michigan, I think this is a call to the church not to retreat, but to double down on our Absolutely. public proclaim of the gospel, of witnessing, of engaging. This is a worldview that is coming to dominate. Right. And one worldview will dominate. It, there's no com there's no compatibility with another worldview when you look at Islam. Yeah, you know, absolutely, Tony. I, I was in London not long ago, and it, it, frankly, it's one of my favorite places in the world. But it's a very it's a very difficult place at a place that demonstrates deep concern. Something struck me that I hadn't really thought about this way before when I was there just months ago, and that is that if you look at the architecture, all the architecture of old says Christianity, but if you look at the cityscape. The new religious architecture is Islamic, it's minarets. I don't think that's uh, accidental. You know, no. and, and, and as you know, Islam intends not only to take over, but to be visible about it. That's why they raised the minarets, just like they did in Constantinople in the 15th century, uh, in the 16th century. That's exactly what's going on. 
And, you know, I think Richard Dawkins, by the way, is one of these strange figures who says, you know, Christianity, we're going to miss it. Well, there's a reason. It's a very tragic statement. Yeah. There's a reason because Christianity has a different understanding, and, and that is by the transformation of the heart and mind through the love of Christ that the world has changed, not through the sword. Yes. And, I mean, think about it for a Absolutely. moment. How many, and I've been to many Muslim countries, I've, I've traveled, I know you have as well. How many of those countries have you been in where you see Christians holding a rally calling for the death of the country in which they're in? Yeah, just for security reasons, I won't mention the country I'm thinking of at the moment, but I can simply tell you that you would be arrested by the religious police. And, and the very fact that you have a religious police tells you there's a categorical difference between you know, the Islamic-dominated world and, uh, and, and, and Europe and, and North America. We don't have a religious police, but most of those nations actually do. Yeah, and there is no deviancy and there's no public, even public expression of these counter viewpoints. So Christianity is different in that it allows men to make, men, women, Absolutely. and children to make a choice. I mean, that's what God did. That's what Christianity does. But we have to preserve the very foundation and the essence that allows Christianity to continue or everyone loses their freedoms. I, I want to transition, we've got a few minutes left, Dr. Moeller, uh, the Vatican. Uh, the doctrine office issued a document at the request of Pope Francis yesterday outlining the Catholic Church's positions on a number of very important issues of human dignity. It's a 20-page document. Uh, it was more than five years in the making, but it actually comes out with some really good positions when it reaffirms the, 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 the church's teachings and the scripture on life. Uh, and one of the contra more controversial issues where they embrace the idea that you know, man has created male and female, um, and this gender ideology is incompatible. Yeah, you know, in this sense, they're just affirming what is the shared Christian worldview, and and that is that creation matters and the ontology matters. That's just the 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 being, the body matters, and uh, so in in this statement, rather amazingly, they go on to say that the body reveals God's intention. So if God reveals a male body, he intends for us to be a man. If God, you know, creates us, gives us a female body, he intends us to be female. Uh, th th this is the exact opposite logic of the new sexual revolutionaries and the ideologies of gender, gender theory. They want to say, you know, your body doesn't tell you anything. It's just an accident. Uh, some inner self tells you whether you're male or female. So I appreciate the Vatican's courage in hitting that head on. And quite frankly, in amazingly straightforward language. And I, I could only hope that many evangelical uh, Protestants would be the equal of that clarity. There are other parts of the document, you know, again, right. it's, a, it's a Vatican document, but <laughs> well, you're right it, to point to those issues. It, it stands in sharp contrast to a recent document and statement regarding the blessing of, of, of same-sex unions. So, I mean, there is clarity here, but I would argue in, in, in scanning through it and reading it, that the clarity comes from the fact it points to Scripture. I mean, that's where we gain our clarity. Absolutely. A a absolutely. And, you know, y y this pope is a particularly slippery figure. But when the teaching office of the Roman Catholic Church comes out with a document like this, they've got to, they've got to demonstrate a consistency and continuity with, you know, centuries of Catholic teaching. That, that's a certain kind of restraint. And I, I, I find it fascinating. They worked on this for years and came back and said, we meant what we said the last time. Uh, and put it in the context of modern confusion. If this were, I don't know, 30 years ago, I mean, it wouldn't even gotten a second glance right. uh, because that well, would have yeah. would have been normal. Well, as a matter of fact, they wouldn't have thought they had to say some of these things. So, True. you know, this is one of those strange moments where we have to say, no, a boy is a boy. You know, and here's anatomy. This is a boy. It's not a girl. You can you can malform the body. You can you can, you know, harm the body. You can, you know, claim as a as a, a legal matter that you have had a sex change, but the reality is the body is crying out XX and XY, and that's God's intention, not a biological accident. My my takeaway from this is what we just we, we mentioned: the the clarity in the document came from its reference to Scripture, and in right. this world where everything has become muddied and it's you know a make believe world. 
the church needs right. to drive a clear stake, a, a, a solid stake in the ground, and that is on Scripture. And, and, and this is Absolutely. where the church needs to move back to a full understanding and teaching of the Scripture and, and discipling its people based upon the Word of God. No, absolutely, and I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, the Vatican does make reference to Scripture, but it claims its own authority. This is where we're in a very different position as evangelical Christians. Right. We believe that God, you know, has given us His inerrant and fallible Word, and that is the authority. And so, quite honestly, it's nice that the Pope and the Vatican say these true things when it comes to, you know, uh, the reality of biological sex and the goodness of God's creation— but quite honestly, our authority for that is exactly as you say. It is the unerring Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, sharper than any two-edged sword. And uh, it's that book that begins in the beginning. Right. And I would add, unchanging. It's not going to change. Amen. We can tether ourselves to it. Dr. Al Mohler, always great to see you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Tony, is always a pleasure. God bless you. All right, Dr. Al Mohler. Always enjoy those conversations. Folks, thanks for joining us today. We are out of time, but until next time, I leave you once again with the encouraging words of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 6, where he says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you have taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.